Lisa Goodman, and I am the author of this book, Glitter and Concrete, A Cultural History of Drag in New York City, which is out now from Hanover Square Press. Thank you so much to Boulder Bookstore for having me. Um, my book is a cultural history of drag in New York, and it goes from 1865 to the present, chronicling drag of all stripes across the city. So you'll find everyone in this book from drag kings to drag queens to, as they're lovingly known, drag things. And this was a book I wanted to read, and it wasn't a book that existed. And um, drag has been a part of my life for almost 30 years. I saw drag for the first time at seven years old when I saw the film Tu Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar. And it's been a part of my life ever since. It's one of the defining art forms of my life, absolutely. And I am a longtime lover and have always wanted to share it with other people. Um, and then in November 2017, the very famous New York drag artist Flawless Sabrina passed away. And Flawless Sabrina had started doing drag in the 1960s and she became mother, grandmother to countless of these wonderful downtown drag and performance artists and just people in general um, here in New York. And she was this beloved figure and she had been written about maybe as much as some other drag artists had been or as much as a drag artist could have been at that time. Um, but that still wasn't a lot. And I wanted to make sure that her story didn't get lost. I wanted to make sure the stories of people like her didn't get lost. Um, New York history is also a long running passion of mine. And I knew that there are, uh, there were many drag artists who were working in the city and who continue to work in the city who built the foundation of the drag that we have today. Um, and I wanted to make sure that they were as much household names as, uh, as some other drag artists you might know. Um, so that's where the inspiration for the book came from. Um, the research I did while working on this book was many fold. Um, so I did about, I think it's 86 interviews with, no, the other way, <laughs> 93 interviews with 86 people or thereabouts. Um, so there are first person accounts throughout the book. And then there was also a ton of archival research. There was the reading of autobiographies. There was the, um, the perusing of programs from the 1940s. There was uh, the listening of recordings from the 1920s and the list goes on and on and on. Um, another question that's here is, what's one unexpected way that drag has changed since its earliest iterations? I think something that I see a lot now, um, and that's something that historically didn't necessarily arise until around the 1970s and into the 1980s was an active uh, dedication to subversion um, and to the subversion of gender norms and societal norms. And while drag itself has always done that in some form or another, just by the nature of the way that it manipulates gender on its own, um, in the 1970s and into the 1980s and moving forward, there were people who adopted drag who, uh, who, were, who were even more explicit in their desires to subvert. Um, so drag was heavily inspired by punk and, and a lot of different subcultures that had more of an edge to them. And that's something that continues today. And it's something that people were, um, people were not keen to be relegated to the background anymore. And I think, um, especially after the Stonewall Uprising, that's something that presents itself in drag as well. Um, another question here is, what makes the drag scene in New York City different than drag scenes in other cities? Um, well, I think what's interesting about New York is that it draws artists of all stripes and it draws, um, it draws people who are looking for what New York has to offer. Um, and it's not to say that that doesn't happen in other cities. And I know that Denver, of course, has a thriving drag scene, uh, to say the very least. Um, but it's just, sometimes it's a matter of concentration. 
Um, and the number of people who are, who are interested in a certain kind of thing in a certain place, sometimes it's just population density. Um, but I think that there are also people here in New York who, um, who have performance backgrounds in theater and New York is very heavily a theater town. Um, and there are people who have backgrounds in dance and it's also a great site for dance. Um, and it's really a, I mean, New York as uh, as many other cities are, is a great site for many arts of many different kinds. And I think there are so many people here who pursue those kinds of arts and then bring that into their drag as well. So like we said, um, theater, dance, comedy, music, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, so I don't know if it's necessarily a case of different. Um, I think sometimes it's just a case of more. Um, and more opportunities as well. And um, I think there are also opportunities to um, to be in many different kinds of drag uh, and in many different realms of drag here that, um, I don't know if you don't get them elsewhere, but um, you find them in abundance here, absolutely. Um, so a couple of books that I have read recently that I really loved, and I will show you them. Um, one is the book Dancing on My Own by Simon Wu, and it is Essays on Art, Collectivity, and Joy, and it's beautiful, and I can't put it down, and it came out this past August. Uh, it's actually a hardback, this is a galley, um, but it's exquisite, and Simon is so smart, and uh, erudite, and uh, thinks so... Um, powerfully and uh, insightfully about the world around him. So I highly recommend that. And then another book I really loved is Ninth Street Women by Mary Gabriel, which uh, is a behemoth, but doesn't read like one. And it's just this beautiful, uh, I'm not sure if you can see down here, but it says Lee Krasner, Elaine de Kooning, Grace Hartigan, Joan Mitchell, and Helen Frankenthaler, five painters and the movement a changed modern art. So it's an art history book, but it's New York history, but it's uh, women's history and it's feminism and uh, the culture in this time. And it was just absolutely exquisite and I couldn't put it down. Um, so those are some books that I loved. Um, and is there anything else I would want you to know about my book? Um, it's a written through history. Um, so there are some pictures but um, it's meant to give space to this story in ways that hadn't been given to it previously. So, you know, you might pick up a photographic history book or you might pick up a theater history book, and I wanted you to have the same opportunity picking up this book. Um, so there she is, that's what she looks like. Um, and so something else I wanted to do with the book is I wanted to not just give a history of drag in New York, I wanted to, uh, so yes, give drag history um, and then also give New York history, queer history, American history. So just like continuing to zoom out so that you can see that how much a part of American history drag actually is. So that was something that was really important to me when I was working on the book as well. Um, and a short passage from the book I would be delighted to read. Thank you for asking, Boulder Bookstore. Um, so I am going to read um, a section that's actually about Flawless Sabrina. Um, and yeah, you can learn a little bit more about her. After buying an expensive ticket to a drag show in his native Philadelphia, Jack Dorishow saw a business opportunity. Then 19 years old and studying psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, he decided to host a drag pageant with some friends. The event was successful, but the queens were suspicious of Dorisho's motives because he wasn't in drag himself. Shortly after, his drag persona took flight. Her name was Flawless Sabrina, and she had a look and demeanor Dorisho later described as bar mitzvah mother, with big swoops of blonde hair and thick, <laughs> thick black cat eyeliner. The goal was to be non-threatening to the pageant contestants to let them know she was mother, not competition. Like other queens who came before her, Sabrina would also be photographed by Deanne Arbus. 
Flawless Sabrina, or Mother Flawless, as Dora Show became known, embarked on a journey hosting pageants throughout the decade. At one point, her company, the Nationals Academy, was big enough to hire 100 people. The contests took place in cities large and small throughout the country, promoted through word of mouth in gay bars and by hired gossip mongers in each city. In 1967, Dora Show moved from Philadelphia to New York specifically to make a documentary about that year's Miss All-America Camp Beauty Pageant, a drag pageant known affectionately as Mind Blow USA to its participants. The Queen was arguably the first insight Americans had into the lives of drag queens. It follows the days leading up to the pageant, the arrival of contestants, rehearsals, the ever important unpacking of wigs, as a host of performers gathered to compete. In the process, we also see the lives of the people behind the drag personas, those who were out long before it was ever acceptable or even legal. Andy Warhol helped secure funding to make the documentary through his connections with Hollywood producers. So that's a little bit about my book, Glitter and Concrete, A Cultural History of Drag in New York City, um, which I'm proud to say is also a Stonewall Honor book, which you can see right there, and was a finalist in LGBTQ plus nonfiction from the Lambda Literary Awards, and was recently named a national bestseller. So please check it out. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you to Boulder Bookstore for having me. Have a good night.